reminded of the words of Ezekiel that says that as you spoke to him, the Spirit entered into him. And so today, as we open your word, we ask you to speak to us. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to fill us. Lord, your word is serious. And so, Lord, we humbly, soberly come before you, Lord, and open our hearts that you would speak into us. Plant your word in our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. For those that have been tracking with us, you'll know that we're up to the, uh, Revelations chapter 2. And if you'd like to meet me at verse 18, we're going to be talking about the church at Thyatira. <coughs> Interesting names, right? Uh, today I've called t- today's message The Hourglass is Running, and you, you will understand why when we get to about the middle of the message. I, uh, I appreciate when I was in Tasmania, my very dear foster mum, she had three sons, And one of them had an enormous Rottweiler, a big bear, big, soft, cuddly, drooly bear of a dog. I love dogs uh, uh, because of what they can do to cats. But I I love dogs. (laughs) (coughs) Uh, 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 But the the reality is uh, uh, Rottweilers in particular seem to have that kind of untrustworthy streak about them. And uh, I remember Leo, big, fat, dogs that it was, uh, when the owners were there and the owners were in the, in the backyard, there wasn't a problem. Uh, they, uh, they would say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with Leo, he's safe, he's not going to hurt you, but never go in the backyard by yourself. What are you trying to say? Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, they kind of kept Leo, Leo was a part of the family, everything was fine, we all knew that he had this untrustworthy streak, I, I like to reference Rottweilers as being like a snake in the grass, but, but something changed. Something really changed for them, and that was when the lady fell pregnant. Almost to the day that she fell pregnant, Leo found a new home, which is interesting. And when I questioned them, they said, oh, now that we're having kids, we can't have Leo here anymore. And as we come to the church at Thyatira, I think the challenge to them and the challenge to us is we tend to tolerate and accept and allow Rottweilers in our lives. Those Rottweilers of, the, of sin, we know at any moment it can destroy us. At any moment it could consume us. We, 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 we kind of, we go into the backyard and we stroke them and we pat them, but we have those sins in our lives. When I want you to know today, and we will find out as we work through the the, the account of the church at Thyatira, you can't have God and the Rottweiler in the backyard. Many of us are comfortable. We kind of cruise in and out of church and we go home and we, we put on our, we're good at putting on our spiritual makeup, right? We, we, we get all danced up and, and everybody, nobody knows anything. Hang on to that thought today as we work through the account to the church. Thyatira. As we're working through the book of Revelation, you know, often we say, well, this doesn't apply to us. You know, these, the context that was going on here, these guys were being persecuted intensely. These guys were often facing physical death for their faith. And, and so many of us here think, well, you know what? This only applies when I've got a Roman soldier in front of me and a sword at my throat. And we forget that the compromise and the toleration that we allow in our lives applies to your life tomorrow when you go to work. The challenge to our worship isn't just when we are faced with that, and I pray that nobody is ever faced with that, with that choice, but it's, the reality is that the message to the churches and the message of revelation to us is that this culture, this world, is trying to change our worship. You can do what you like, but don't say those kinds of things. Don't do those kinds of things. We don't want to hear from you. As we begin our journey into Thyatira, a little bit of context that's going to help us to understand what the Christians were facing there. Uh, Thyatira was a a city that was founded by Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great and his soldiers in particular worshipped the god Apollo, the Greek god Apollo. Uh, And the Greek god Apollo was called, this is going to be very pertinent in a moment, they regarded him and called him the son of the gods. Apollo was regarded as being the son of the gods. And uh, Thyatira still had a temple at this point in time. Thyatira still had a temple 
to Apollo. And it's going to become important in a moment. But what we know about Thyatira is there was something a little bit different. They, they weren't a massive church. They weren't overly prominent as a church or a city. They, yeah, they were reasonably prosperous and they were one of the major cities of Asia Minor. But something very different about them to the other cities was this. They, they had what they called these guilds. And these guilds were like, the best way to understand them is today is they like our labour unions, our trade labour unions. And before you go, okay, worthless and money grabbing, no, that's not the end of it all. The, the, the reality is that uh, they were very different in this time. Every trade and every craft in Thyatira had its own guild. And Thyatira was known for its particularly its textiles, I'll touch on that in a moment, that's how we find the church at Thyatira, particularly for its textiles, but its silversmiths and its bronze smiths. It had, it had elaborate trades. It was a closed shop. If you were in Thyatira, yeah, you could be here. Yes, you can live here, but you had to be in one of these trades, one of these crafts, and you had to be in one of the guilds. One of the biggest differences was that quite regularly, these guilds would throw enormous festivals for their members. These festivals involved going up to the Temple Apollo and, and worshipping the Temple Apollo and, and, and eating food sacrificed to idols and, and engaging in debaucherous acts up there. And every one of them, if you did not participate, this was a big problem because your non-participation in these festivals might mean that Apollo will frown upon that craft and that trade. So you were kicked out. And without any swords at people's throats, all of a sudden Thyatira and the church at Thyatira has got a choice here. <laughs> and it's beginning to impact the church and we will see in what ways it's impacting the church. Let's begin with what Jesus has to say to those that would worship Apollo, to those that will go to the temple and declare him to be the son of God, Jesus has something to say to the church at Thyatira. Where does the church come from? We know in Acts chapter 16 that there's a, a wonderful lady there that's been converted by Paul by the name of Lydia. Lydia, we know, is a trader in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. She goes back, starts the church. Jesus says... And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write the words of the Son of God. I'm the Son of God. And what happens next changes the perspective sometimes maybe of what we think of Jesus, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And both of those references are a reference to pending judgment. Both of them. If you are looking over the shoulder of the church at Thyatira right now and you are reading this letter, every single person reading this letter knows exactly what those words mean. And often uh, we kind of have to get a little bit serious today because sometimes there is the misconception. This is what I love about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, the word revelation or apocalypse simply means that the curtain was dropped. The reality was always there. Jesus has always been there. Jesus will always be there. Jesus came, yes, cloaked into this world. His, his glory was cloaked. But when John sees Jesus in chapter 1, he falls down like a dead man. And often we have a picture of Jesus with bright blue eyes and long blonde hair flowing in the wind with a little lamb in his arms. But what John saw was a completely different Jesus. Jesus. A God that bears a sword. In fact, later on in Revelation, we will see that the rider on the white horse had a tattoo down his leg, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he had a sword in his hands. This is a dramatically different Jesus. This letter is dramatically different to anyone we have touched on, yet what is going on in this church is different. Let's, let's read on and find out what's going on here. I, uh, I, I know your works, says Jesus. I know your love and your faith and your servants. I know your patience 
and that your latter works exceed the first. They're better, this is a better recommendation than Ephesus. These, these guys haven't slipped. These guys are growing. And, and often we read this in the letters. I know your works. I know your love. I know your service. And, and, and for us, how does that apply? Today, before we go any further, I want you to know you can be sitting in this room today and you can love Jesus and you can diligently be serving Jesus in some kind of role or ministry. You can be involved in that, but you can't do that and continue to have the Rottweiler at home. You can't continue to do that and go and pat the Rottweiler of those pet sins that we have. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody can see. Nobody knows what's, what I think or what I feel. God does. We will find out. And today, the words maybe that apply to us is, you know what, this isn't about, you might be sitting here and go, but I love Jesus. That, okay. And I've definitely surrendered my life to Jesus. And if that's not you this morning, don't leave here today without surrendering your life to Jesus. But, but you can be in that position and there still be a but. That's what we're learning in the book of Revelation. Is that you can be in that position and there can still be a but. Jesus says, I know your works. This, this church is growing, man. But how, how often we like to rest on our laurels. How often we like, when, everybody can, when anybody might confront us with maybe something that's in our hearts, maybe when the Holy Spirit confronts us, we, our first reaction is, yes, but I go to church every week and, and I always give my money and I diligently serve in that role and God sees all of that. But he sees your Rottweiler at home too. And before we get to the end today, there are people in this room that are halfway up the mountain or a third of the way up the mountain of God and wonder why you can't go any further. There are people in this room that are suffering defeat in their marriages, defeat in their personal life, their, maybe their physical life, maybe their work life. You're suffering defeat and you can't put your finger on it. And what God wants to address today is you can't go any further. Uh, we will get to the end and point this out when we get to the end. But, but you can't go any further and bring your Rottweiler. He's got to go and then you can keep going. Buy a Jack Russell. <laughs> Don't buy a Jack Russell. <laughs> I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Jesus comes at verse 20 with a but. But I have this against you. What Jesus has against the church at Thyatira, we will see, is that you tolerate. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Just put a bookmark there. We'll come back to Jezebel in a moment. Who calls herself a prophetess. That's really important. Who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. The word tolerate means what we allow or what we permit. It, it speaks of what we allow space for in our lives. Now, I need to be clear here. What we tolerate is a little bit different. I know that sometimes... All of us slip and stumble in many ways. We do. We, we, often the enemy sneaks in the back door. We, we, we've left our guard down. We haven't been watching our six. Next thing you know, somebody, the enemy slips, slips in the back door. We slip, we fall, we, we say something we shouldn't. We think something we shouldn't. That happens for all of us. In fact, the epistle of 1 John says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and you are a liar and God is not in you. We all sin. And I know, I know everybody here is going, Pastor, you sin? I know, it's a shock. But <laughs> if we can move past that, uh, my wife's not shocked. If we can move past that. This is different. You see, those, uh, those moments in our life is where the enemy slips in the back door. We've, we haven't been watching because Jesus said to his disciples, you've got to watch, you've got to be ready, you've got to be on guard. You got to, your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. What do lions do? Have a look. They sneak around in the grass looking for one they may devour. And we get, we get ostracised on our own. He slips in the back door. This is different. What we tolerate isn't somebody slipping in the back door. What we tolerate, we've prepared a room for and said, you can, you can live here. I'm going to have all of my house, I'm going, to have, I'm going to have all of my walk with Jesus, but you can have this room over here where nobody else can see you, but I know you're there. And I'm going to come and visit whenever I like. You can, you can live here. 
That's called toleration. You're allowing it. You're making space in your life for something. Jesus says, you, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Jezebel is symbolic, symbolic, symbolic. There was an actual woman there called Jezebel, uh, but she is symbolic and it's important of a woman or maybe a group. And she called herself a prophetess. Now, uh, what we can deduce about this woman, who we don't actually know her real name, but what we can deduce is whatever she was teaching, what she was declaring, we'll unpack her teaching in a moment, she was declaring that this is the word of God. You know, in the Old Testament, I just need to digress for a moment to clear something up. In the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, what that actually means is it's not using God's name as a swear word. You shouldn't do that either. But for those that use God's name as a swear word, it's a picture of the heart, by the way, but um, that's not what that means. Because nobody was actually running around in the Old Covenant, running around in the Old Testament times, running around telling people and using God's name as a swear word. What it is, is it is either teaching, speaking, or acting in a sinful and wicked way, but saying God is endorsing this. You're using his name in vain. That's what this woman's doing. Maybe it's a woman, maybe it's a group, but that's what she's doing. What she's doing is teaching the church in authority, and they're tolerating this. This is the problem. You're tolerating her. Hang on a second. So, and her teaching is leading them astray. Let's, let's unpack this because the reason Jesus uses the word Jezebel is not a mistake. For those that don't know the fullness of the story, uh, we, 1 Kings 17, I think, begins the story of Jezebel. Jezebel marries the then king, she's not an Israelite, she marries the then king Ahab. Ahab it will go down in history as Israel's most wicked, evil, sinful king. He led the entire nation, just about, into a deep, deep sin. And often what we think is that Jezebel kind of wanted the whole of Israel to come away and worship Baal, because that's what Jezebel did. She comes to Ahab, she incites him to begin to worship Baal. Uh, Baal was the god of the pagans and the fertility god, so it's kind of today maybe the gods of the world. But, but she, she did something very sneaky. And something that hasn't gone away in many hundreds and thousands of years. What she did was, she didn't say you have to stop worshipping your God and worship Baal. She says, no, you can worship both. And it leads to a pointy end where Elijah comes to Mount Carmel. I love the words of Ahab. Uh, Elijah pro approaches the king again. <laughs> and as he's approaching uh, Ahab says, here's the troubler of Israel, or here's the troublemaker. Righteous troublemakers, that's a, I, I like that label. You know, sometimes when people get sick of us pointing out the sin in our culture, maybe, maybe we will be called troublemakers as well, but Elijah approaches Ahab and says, you know what, go and get all of Israel, assemble them at the bottom of Mount Carmel. And you know what? Bring all the prophets of Baal and we'll have, a, we'll have a showdown. We'll find out who's God. And we know the story of what happens at Mount Carmel. But I love the verse. I think it's verse 21 of chapter 18. A very, very important verse. Israel is all there. All the prophets of Baal are there. And Elijah walks out. By the way, Jezebel had killed nearly every prophet she could get her hands on, which is, I will silence every other voice. I will silence the word of God. And what happens is Elijah stands up and says, Righto, you guys, stop limping, he says, between two opinions. Stop limping between two opinions. If God is God, then follow him. And if Baal, then you follow him. And we're going to find out who's who right now. And for those that know the story, of course, the prophets of Baal, they get their altar. Uh, Elijah even helps them build it. it gives them the, the first cuts. You, take the, you, you do all your dance and, and Elijah mocks them. Maybe he's on the toilet, he said. Maybe he's relieving himself. But for those that have read the story, we know that Elijah prepares the altar, prepares the animal on top of the altar, uh, digs a trench, fills it with water, and the fire of God comes down and licks even the water up out of the trench. If you're at home and you're thinking to yourself, what can I pray for the Rock Christian Church? Please pray for that fire to fall on this church. To so consume each and, each and every one of us. 
that Jezebel had attempted to lead them astray, had taught them you can have a you can have God and you can still have all of the world. And if that's you sitting here this morning, the message of Scripture is clear. You've got to make a choice. You can't keep limping between Jesus and the world. We kind of like to date Jesus, don't we? It's like <clears throat> God wants to marry us, but we keep dating. You know, Jesus, I'll give you a call. <laughs> you know, maybe when things are going bad in my life, I'll give you a call. Maybe when, maybe when I need you or when I'm sick or, or, when, or, 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 or when the bank wants to foreclose, maybe I'll give you a call then or, or maybe I'll slide in and, and, and I'll date you once a month, Jesus. Jesus doesn't date anybody. Now, Paul says, speaking about husbands and wives, he says, I'm talking about a mystery about Jesus and his church. Great picture of our relationship with God is marriage. Jesus waits at the altar for every single one of us. And the the decision before Thyatira is the same decision that's before each and every one of us. Stop dancing with the world. Stop thinking you can dance with two partners. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Imagine going to a dance with your partner and you dance with everybody else that's there. That's what Israel was doing. And Elijah confronts them and says, stop dancing. How long will you limp between two opinions? Jesus says, you have tolerated that woman Jezebel. Here's three words. I, I can't ever remember using these three words, but they're the most three, dangerous three words you could hear in a church. God told me. I don't care what preacher stands here. I don't care who's opening the Bible here. Please go home and open your Bibles and confirm it for yourself. Jezebel was leading the church astray and they were tolerating her teaching. What does Jesus have to say? You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And I think somebody asked me a question a while ago, what's the big deal about eating food sacrificed to idols? In the first century, uh, eating food was a deep, intimate, uh, if, you had, if you're invited to a meal, it was an intimate relationship of fellowship. And so the whole problem is if you're eating food sacrificed to idols and you know it, what you're actually doing is you're fellowshipping with those gods. That's, that's the problem. What Paul says to the Corinthians is if you're eating meat and you don't know that it was sacrificed to idols then your conscience is clear. That's why the difference is you're not, you're not fellowshipping with these gods. But it doesn't get real good for this church. This is where the hourglass is going to come into play right now. Verse 21, I gave her time to repent. I gave her time to repent. The hourglass has been running for some time and Jezebel, whoever she is, her hourglass has run out. This is an important lesson for each and every one of us in this room. You are not guaranteed your next breath. No one in this room is actually guaranteed to make it to that door at 12.05 when I finish preaching. (laughs) I'm not guaranteed to make it to 12.05 now that I've said that. The reality is the hourglass is ticking for every person in this room. And we, we often look at the Old Testament, you know, and go, well, that was the angry God of the Old Testament, you know. <laughs> God wasn't taking his meds back in the Old Testament. But it's the same God in the Old Testament that's in the New Testament. We're just in this bubble of grace. God just turned the hourglass upside down and said, you know what, I'll give these guys time to repent. You might be sitting in this room today and say, I have never surrendered my life to Jesus. Your hourglass is running. You might be sitting in this room today and say, you know what? I've got two or three Rottweilers sitting at home that nobody knows about. Your hourglass is running. And for Jezebel, it's run out. God says, I gave her time to Repent. If you're sitting here saying, what on earth am I going to do about those Rottweilers? I want to go deeper with God. I want, I want victory in my life. I want to tell you today, the gateway, the doorway, the key you're looking for is repentance. Repent, therefore, says Peter, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Something comes before the times of refreshing, repentance. 
You know, repentance isn't a quick, forgive me God and run out the door. Repentance is changing your mind. Uh, repentance looks like I'm going to stop trying to dance with the world and Jesus and I'm going to walk away from the world and burn the bridges as I'm going. Don't look back, friends. Burn those bridges. Say, God, I'm never going back. I gave her time to repent. I, I, if you're sitting here today and you're thinking to yourself, what does repentance look like, Pastor? I, I love the parable that Jesus tells us in Luke 18. You can read it for yourself later when you get home. It tells us a parable about two men that go up to the temple to pray. One of them is a Pharisee and the other one is a tax collector. And the Pharisee turns and he's, as he's praying, he says, Oh God, Father, I thank you that I'm not like everybody else. I thank you that I'm not an extortioner, an adulterer, and I'm not like this tax collector over here. And then Jesus goes on and says, but the tax collector would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but he beats upon his breast and says, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. And Jesus says, the latter went home justified that day. What does repentance look like? I need you, Jesus. You may as well be honest with God. We're about to find out that he knows everything anyway. Jezebel's time had run out, but all oh, compassionate, gracious, awesome, wonderful, loving God is going to give her children time to repent. Let's listen to this. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses, refuses, refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Does that word apply to you today? Does the word refuse apply to you today? Verse 22, behold, I will throw her under a sickbed. Listen, when God throws you, you're in trouble. The story of Job, God lowers the heads. The agent of destruction is absolutely the enemy. When the agent of destruction is God throwing you onto a sickbed, you've just landed in some trouble. I'll throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation. <whistles> Hello. Unless they repent of her works. More time for them. Verse 23, and I will strike her children dead. Meek and mild Jesus holding the lamb with a long block? No, not here. Changed his hair. I will strike her children dead and all the, now we're coming to the crunch now, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. Number one and number two, they will know that I will give to each of you according to your works. Many will know that one of the jobs I had in Tasmania was working in the Country Club Casino. For, for those who are unaware, it's an enormous complex. I think a few people here have been there. It's an enormous complex in Launceston. At, at that point in time when I was there, I think it had about 500 employees. And I want to introduce you to one of the employees that kind of highlights what I want to draw out here because you might be sitting here today going, well, no one knows about my little pet Rottweilers I've got at home. Well, God knows. God sees all. God hears your thoughts. And they're, they're like speech before God. And we had this cleaner by the name of Trevor. Now, Trevor was a really nice guy. He had a really bubbly personality. Uh, on the surface, he was just a great guy. Everybody in the casino said, ha, what a great guy Trevor is. And Trevor used to do most of the afternoon shifts with cleaning. And he used to do them on his own because in the afternoon shift, you would be on your own. And uh, something irked me about Trevor, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. One day, Trevor turns up. I'm walking out as he's walking in, and I could have sworn I smelled alcohol on him. I think, hang on a second. They used to breath at you before you came in once at the casino, but they don't do that anymore. And he got a little bit, he crossed some boundaries with some of the other lady staff while he was there. And everybody said, including those that were in charge, he's a nice guy, he just made a little mistake. But, ah. Uh, Anyway, working in the storeroom means that when somebody uses a product anywhere on the premises, I automatically get an email that I have to replace that product. Interestingly enough, that when I would come in after Trevor's afternoon shifts, there was a particular alcoholic beverage that only he drank that we never seemed to replace anywhere else. So I got suspicious. We had a security guy that was working uh, with us then, and I tell you, uh, I, you could lose sleep over finding out what these guys know. And I said, listen, I think Trev's up to something. And he said, well, you know, he says, the technology we've got here is pretty advanced. He says, we can take a picture of his face, 
He says, put it into the system, and every time his face hits a camera, it'll put up a feed. He says, and it'll just be a Trevor feed. And you will see everything he does. I said, keep talking. <laughs> and they said, getting... I knew the manager, Colin. So I said to Colin, I said, for two shifts. I said, for two shifts, can you do this for me? Colin came down and said, you won't believe what we found. He said, this guy has a systematic pattern. He walks in, he starts his shift, he goes to this bar, sneaks a drink, this bar, sneaks a drink, this bar, sneaks a drink. And the feed they had on this guy was amazing. I'm thinking, oh. All of a sudden, you become really careful about where you pick your nose, right? <laughs> I found out in the enormous complex, there's only two places that those cameras don't exist. The first one is in any of the bathrooms, and the second one was in my cool room, keg room, where I had all the alcohol. New Year's Eve, hello. <laughs> Long story. <laughs> However, Trevor thought, nice guy. Yeah, everybody thought, nice guy. But Trevor thought, I'm getting away with this. But he, the eyes were on him and they saw every move, just like God sees every move. Can I tell you, friends, yeah. that after that news feed, two things never happened again. Trevor did, never did another shift at the Country Club Casino and I never undid my pants and adjusted myself in the mirrors in the elevator ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Lenny, if you're listening, you're welcome. I didn't know they had cameras behind those mirrors. <laughs> when a man's got a tuck, a man's got a... God said, move on, Sean. <laughs> Just like Trevor, you, we, we, we may not see, okay? You can turn up here Sunday. I, I've, we've experienced it. Uh, people have come here on a Sunday, hey, love, yeah, awesome, look good on the outside. I got an email on the Tuesday, you would not believe the mess their life was in. But on the outside here on a Sunday, everything looks hunky-dory. You know what? God sees. God knows you've got those Rottweilers. God knows the email you, you want to send to the pastor, lizardtherock.org. <laughs> So you may as well be honest and you may as well put the Rottweiler on the table. The churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works. Here's some end times theology for you right now. Here's, if you want to sum up the end times theology of all of the passages... Including Revelation, here it is. Each and every single person in this room will stand before Almighty God and give an account of the life that you have lived. Jesus is returning and he says at the end of the book of Revelation, he says soon, which is by surprise. And I pray, I pray that he will not catch anybody in this room by surprise. But you will stand before him and you will give an account. You won't give an account to me. You won't give an account to anybody else in this room you will give an account to God who sees all. I'm going to ask Stu if he can come back and, and just play as we bring this to a close this morning. The final words for Thyatira sound like this, but to the rest of you in Thyatira, this doesn't apply to everybody. And you might be sitting here going, well, pastor, you know what? Nice word, but I've surrendered my life to Jesus. I'm not sure I've got any Rottweilers. Holy Spirit's not really putting his finger on anything, putting his whole hand. No, it's... But to the rest of you in Thyatira, if that's you this morning, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, that's a message for another day. To, to you, I say, do not lay on you any other burden, but this, only hold fast what you have until I come. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers, let's read this all the way to the end. The one who conquers, the one who conquers, great word, and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Verse 27, this, I want to read this to the end because the greatest reward lies in, in, to this church. 
and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. Does anybody know who the morning star is? Jesus. Here's what I like about Abraham. Abraham was a moon worshipper that still got everything wrong. He still lied about who his wife was three times after God called him. But what I love about Abraham is God comes down and makes a covenant with Abraham and says, you know what? I will be your exceedingly great reward. Abraham says, I'm in. Jesus says to the church at Thyatira, for those who will hold fast, I'll give you all of myself. What else do you want? You might be sitting here saying, you know what, I'm struggling and I, and I want to be closer to God and I can never put my finger on it. I want to tell you a story today from Joshua chapter 7. And for those who don't know the context of Joshua chapter 7, you can go home and read the whole chapter for yourself. But basically what's happened is Israel's come, they've come through the river, Jordan, they've, 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 we've seen the destruction of Jericho by the mighty hand of God and they've subdued their enemies and everything's going really swimmingly. And what they don't know is that there's a little guy by the name of Achan that snuck some of this devoted stuff. They were told not to touch that stuff. God made it clear. So Achan just kind of hide some of this stuff. And Joshua says, you know what? He says to the men, go up, he says, and have a look at a little place called Ai. We still don't even know where it is. No one knows where it actually was on the map. Little place. Spies come back and say, you know what, Dave? Don't trouble yourself, mate. There's only like a couple of thousand up there. We'll go up there and handle it. No dramas. They are horribly, miserably defeated. They run back with their tail between their legs. David falls on his face. God tells him to get up. David made one mistake. First one was he didn't inquire of the Lord. Uh, Sorry, uh, Joshua. He didn't inquire of the Lord. The second thing that we learn from that account is that you might think, you know what, I, I, I can have all of God and hide these little sins over here. But the reality is what we learn from Joshua chapter 7 is simply this, you cannot. Many of us are suffering defeat. Many of us are allowing those to defeat us because we're trying to keep the Rottweiler in the backyard. I'm going to pray now. I'm going to ask everybody if we can stand as I pray. If you're here today, and... You've never surrendered to Jesus. I want you to know that that hourglass is running and you don't have any control over it. If you're here today thinking you can keep the Rottweiler and have all of God, the hourglass is running. But I've got some really good news for you today. Every single person is only ever one step away from God and that's the step where you turn around and repent. And I want to open up the front if you, if, if you need prayer this morning. If God's placed his finger on that Rottweiler in your life and you need prayer, then we'd be happy to pray with you. If you're happy to do business with God in your seat, or if you've never surrendered to Christ, then don't leave here today. Father, as we stand before you, I pray that we would be so empty that you could fill us. There'd be nothing but the Holy Spirit inside of us. Lord, we are as close to you as we want to be. We are as close to you as we want to be and I pray that each and every one of us would be drawn closer that each and every one of us would get rid of the Rottweilers in our lives that we would clean out that room and that we would invite you into the house Father we need your help we need your fire 
we need the Holy Spirit. We need our high priest advocating for us. Jesus, today we need your blood on us. So thankful for the blood that cleanses us. Father, I pray right now that each person would leave. Lord God, empty and with you at the number one place in their lives. In the wonderful name of Jesus.